some of the more like sort of interesting applications at least that are that are kind of out there today that that I'm like, you know especially interested in are, are kind of relate to the compression aspect of these of like zero speakers. Um, I think like one thing to note is that you know like we we, we get a bit more specific like what is zero knowledge proof? You know like, you've probably heard of things like SNARKs. So when you have like SNARK actually stands for like a synced non-reactive argument of knowledge, right? Um, and the succinctness part is actually the important part here. Like you can have an argument of knowledge, and the argument of knowledge could just be just be me like sending the string that I want to prove over to you. And that would be a valid argument of knowledge. But I actually want to generate something that's you know succinct. Like there's some compression property, right? Like you might think of hash functions as, as one of these instructions where you can take some input and compress it to some other code domain, which is you know smaller in, in length, right? Um, but the succinct, succinctness property is the thing that really allows you to like compress computation. So if we want to like, you know, you write some solidity program, you write some program in Rust. You want to compress that in, in a format that can be verified efficiently. So, like, there's this idea, you know, that, that also came from like interactive proofs, like in the 80s and the 90s. But this idea of like delegation of computation. So when people were like, sort of building these proof systems, this idea of delegation of computation was like already embedded in their um, their understanding of proof system, which was that like I have some, you know, maybe large computer that can compute, um, you know, really fast, can some like TPU, GPU, something, some supercomputer, and then I have some other device, maybe my iPhone or some other mobile phone that can just verify that supercomputer. So I don't actually have to execute the program over and over again. And that's sort of the powerful property I think um, it's like it's pretty it's like sort of very, very useful. Um, in particular like we've been working with it um, for developing like maybe you know trustless cross chain messaging and, and also um, for thinking about ways to scale like cross chain data oracles. Awesome. Um, so we're up here you know speaking quite confidently about you know, ZK tech as if it's uh, all been discovered and I'm of the opinion that or uh, as far as I know I'm not actually going to ask them we, we still have a lot to go so uh, you guys opinions on how much has the ZK tech been explored and kind of where are we on that journey and uh, I'll throw it back over to you uh, yeah I mean I, I think like looking at the the history of like zero knowledge proofs is like pretty interesting I think like the, the first like construction of like zero knowledge proofs like was um, kind of around like in, in the mid 90s um, came from like you know Shifty Goldwasser and like Sylvia McCauley and others that really like pioneered this effort. But what they were talking about at the time were like zero knowledge interactive proofs. Um, they weren't talking about you know, the snarks that you see today. Um, and that, like, I think the zero knowledge properties is interesting. Um, but I think the real power, like, the usefulness of these proof systems, like, in, in blockchains in particular, came from the from these aspects of like non interactivity and also succinctness that you get with snarks. Um, and in particular with like pre processing snarks, which are, you know, I guess, like, become. More and more usable um, over time, um, but I think like we're definitely on the frontier of these. Like I think every few weeks you see a new paper that uh, you know postulates some new like idea in zero knowledge, and there's like def definitely a lot, lot like very cool ideas being explored in that space. Like you know, having the recursive proofs. Um, there's all sorts of you know like the Starks were another invention. Now there's uh, the lines between Snarks and Starks have been blurring more and more to the point where I don't even know what a Snark versus a Stark is. A point you just kind of understand that they're using some polynomial equipment scheme with some like IOP system and you have the proof system. So, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, John, what do you think about the progress in CK? Um, yeah, maybe I'll talk about kind of more application level because that's more where I live. Um, you know, I would say that like the number of applications that are alive is still relatively limited, even if I think about what ASTEC is doing. Like, we really have very, we only have four circuits in production right now that are very, very simple. Um, one is an account circuit, it verifies that you have this um, encrypted node that proves that you have an ASIC account. There's this joint split circuit that ensures that you have you know, appropriate sends and receives privately, inter internally to our system. And then there's something that we call the DeFi circuits, which are allow uh, our private system to interact with Ethereum layer one. So that is what we call ASIC Connect. And ASIC Connect is like a VPN layer for Ethereum where you get to interact with any layer one protocol with complete privacy. Um, it looks like essentially a proxy network where it says Aztec Private Rollup did certain transaction on either scan, but you don't really know who the underlying is. I think what a, a bunch of teams are working on, including Aztec, is a more generalized private smart contract protocol um, where you get to write arbitrary programs um, using custom circuits um, where you can essentially prove anything. Uh, you can build any application with uh, flexible programmable privacy, and that's what is going to open the floodgates for innovation, including for you know a domain that obviously impacts the privacy space today compliance we're like you know the holy grail is some degree of compliance or 
being able to prove that your, your activity falls within certain bounds uh, while protecting consumer privacy. Um, I think that's really challenging today to do, but a bunch of teams are racing toward a solution, um, and I think the urgency has only gotten up recently. Should we add anything? I think uh, that's a pretty good uh, overview. I think uh, in general, what I can see is this kind of like a, a delicate dance between the application and the processor, right? So I think uh, on the application side, like many um, like innovators, smart contract developers, and uh, ZK application developers are pushing the boundaries. And on the proof system side, um, people who are designing the proof system find, uh, try to improve and think how to help the application developers. And uh, in particular, um, what I think of, uh, my interest is that how can we use a kind of like a layered abstractions to help the application developers. So this is a, um, like a Poseidon lab, what we're doing is that we're doing the research, we're doing a new kind of like virtual machine. So the basic idea here is that what we think right now is that uh, there are a lot of proof systems. Right? So there is almost one new groundbreaking uh, proof system every single year. And uh, there is a lot of uh, new hash functions what we are thinking missing in the space right now is um, we call it a standard library. Right? We want to build a reusable kind of a circuit so that everyone can use and compose it. So that's, uh, that's what we're working on and pretty excited about. So it sounds like a pretty pretty early step on yeah. the ZK. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then just one last question here on the called the introduction section is speaking philosophically for a moment, what do, what do we as individuals have to gain from access to to uh, zero knowledge cryptography and the software that's that's behind it. Why is it important that you know at the individual level that this is an accessible technology? And uh, you want to start with that, Shimon? So I think, um, I think uh, in the I would have to say in the past five years, um, despite the tool chain is still quite early, but we do see the zk tool chain is becoming more and more accessible for normal programmers. Right. So there are a lot of toolings. Uh, for example, the tooling like Artworks for kind of like a more sophisticated programmers. There are toolings like Circom for like a relatively um, like young like programmers just into the space, right? I think we, we do see kind of like a proliferation of the zk toolings getting there. And uh, from individuals, I think it's now actually it's the best time to actually jump into the zk development to try to using Circom or some zk toolings to build build some circuit and deploy on chain and try how it works. Right? I think that's it's, it's really amazing, still kind of a, have a, a steep learning curve, but I think the learning curve nowadays is much, much shallower than uh, five years ago. And also, um, as a, a, as a, like a Poseidon lab, we're trying to contribute like public good uh, uh, zero knowledge proof uh, infrastructure as well, so hopefully we can be part of the effort. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Rahul, what, uh, what do you think, what, what do we have to gain from access to ZK? Yeah, I think, uh, but fundamentally, it's sort of like this is more of a philosophical sort of uh, maybe answer. But I think um, so. The question, like I think, I like to ask is like, how are we gonna you know get the next sort of like one billion users in Web three, right? Or like what's the next set of users that are gonna be on, on this like new sort of internet platform, distributed system platform? And the question I think that I want to answer is like, how do we do this, right? Like like how do we get the properties so that like when these users want to come and they want these applications. Um, they're actually going to they're going to enjoy it, right? Like, you know, I, I find like when, when we talk to a lot of developers um, and also users, like we ask them, like, do, do you use crypto? Like, like you ask a bunch of developers, like, what applications crypto use, and they say, well, I don't actually use crypto. Well, that's interesting. Well, you're you're building the fundamental, you know, rails of of crypto, but you don't use crypto. Um, and like, I think maybe one of the fundamental things um, that I've learned from that is like, maybe we haven't built applications that people want to use. And why is that? I think largely because um, we just don't have the infrastructure um, available to us to allow, like, for you know, properties of scaling that allow us to build things that people want to use. Right? Like, if I want to play a game, if I want to play League of Legends on blockchain, if I want to do, you know, poker um, cross chain, I want to, I want to play with someone across the world, I want to settle in real time, I want to do all these things that are traditionally available to do in Web two. How am I going to do that? And I think, like, zero knowledge proofs, or particularly validity proofs. Um, are very, very, like a very important paradigm, a new primitive for blockchains. Like I sort of think of them as like lift and curve cryptography, right? Like they are a fundamental primitive that you can access, that you should be able to access, right? And then you can build out infrastructure using that primitive. Um, we we haven't like built this primitive in a way that's accessible to, to a lot of people yet. Um, like there's more and more application development, but I think like fundamentally we're still in this phase, at 
least in, in blockchains, where like the infrastructure needs to be more robust, um, and like that's sort of like why I'm more interested on the, on the infrastructure side and, and talk about this more maybe later as well. But we've been working on like you know accelerating some of these groups on, on hardware platforms and thinking about like can we use FPGAs, um, can we use GPUs, can we use things that will actually you know kind of help solve some bottlenecks um, in, in like generating zero knowledge groups and using them. John, go for it. Yeah, I, I strongly agree with that. Scalability and um, is one of the major UX problems in crypto right now. Um, but I would make the argument for privacy and consumer privacy. I think we had this fight in the 1990s with SSL, and ZKs kind of are magical in that um, they allow for these new privacy constructions that we're just not used to in our day-to-day -day lives. And so, you know, for any of you who've ever done a real estate transaction or you know tried to get an apartment or get a house or something like that, you have to do a proof of income. Um, I think building these interoperable systems where you can seamlessly pass proofs of you know, validity proofs uh, and proofs of knowledge back and forth to um, maintain encryption and secrecy um, while proving a definitive fact. So like your income, for instance, being able to just definitively say, here's a blob of math that shows that I make over $60,000 a year or $80,000 a year or whatever I need to qualify for this apartment without giving up my bank statements, without giving up my W-2s. Um, there's something really powerful about that idea, even beyond of the blockchain application. Um, so that's what gets me excited about CKPs and privacy and uh, specific. Amazing. Cool. And I know you guys have hinted around this, but just to be blunt, to uh, just ask it bluntly, in respect to what you're working on, how are you using uh, CKPs? And I'll just throw it back to you, John. Um, yeah, uh, you mean just uh, how Aztec uses the technology? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would go back to the fact that we're a ZK, ZK rollup, and we're, we're trying to um, use both aspects of ZKs both the succinctness and compressibility component, um, and also the fact that it provides uh, end user privacy. And so if you think about kind of like a transaction leaving your machine unencrypted, um, we believe like privacy is lost in that exact moment. And so we want to make sure that uh, transactions are encrypted at the moment that uh, they leave your machine, and then they can be aggregated later, so you get both cost savings and privacy reduction. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Rahul, how are you seeing uh, CKPs in your work? Yeah, I think um, in general, you probably heard this maybe over and over again, but uh, like Jump Crypto in general is like sort of interested in building the next generation of, of crypto infrastructure. Um, and I think like zero knowledge groups at the end of the day are like a fundamental component of that. And uh, if, if we believe that the world is going to be powered, if this is like a new primitive that's going to exist, like uh, we want to help like, you know, sustain that and, and, and build some of the things that, that, that make it possible for this to be like a widespread primitive that people can access and use. Um, so we're, we've been working on, you know, I think I mentioned like accelerating some of these proof systems so we can get proof generation times down. Um, the other component is like using them for trustless cross-chain messaging. Um, I think like that's a really interesting example of, of using zero knowledge proofs where you can sort of prove the state um, or the consensus of one chain on another um, and, and instead of trying to you know, port the take the whole chain and put it on another chain. Um, and then we've sort of explored other ideas too, um, kind of, kind of in, you know, more, more on the research side, which is like, can we use it for things like cross-chain data ripples? Can we like think about compressing you know, aggregation logic for you know, price prices from different components and, and, and doing it off-chain in some manner? And then um, just simply verifying those proofs on-chain. Um, so there's like multiple different avenues, but I think like um, in general, we're just interested in like the power of the technology and like just researching and exploring like how they can be useful. Amazing. Shubo, how are you using CQ? Oh, fantastic. Yeah. We're basically using the KP kind of experience that The first thing is that Using ZK as a, the ZK protocol ZK to provide for mental privacy for a financial transaction, and in fact we actually build the fastest uh, like private private payment protocol using ZK. Right, so we have a highly optimized circuit and uh, uh, optimizing from the uh, new curve operation to the hash function construction to the protocol construction, so that this is the fastest uh, uh, privacy payment protocol you can put on chain. That's uh, that's the first regard. And second regard is that we are building um, a new virtual machine so that to bring pro programmable privacy, which using a ZK different circuit, and they can be using a composite way, that's the first. And second is that uh, um, like uh, the, uh, the it gives a programmer programmability using ZK. Right? And last but not least, kind of related to the second point is that we are building a ZK tooling infrastructure so that uh, I think the only goal here is that to let um, like a developer, for example, if you can just write Solidity, you should be leveraging these ZK primitives to create your own construction. Right? This is the three aspect of working with ZK. Yeah. 
some and, and just this one's going to be an open question for you three. Don't, uh, all three don't have to answer, but um, I think it's, it's pretty apparent, hopefully, to the, to the audience right now that this is a pretty hardcore technology. Um, so it, it doesn't, doesn't seem easy or, or, or simple to implement. So, um, kind of, what, what are what are some of the difficulties you're, you're running to uh, today the, when, you're, when you're trying to actually implement this stuff? I guess I can, I can start by so I mean, if you look at the history of this long technology, it's always going to be hard for any. But uh, I think people will find a way and should find a way. I think the way it's going to play out is that uh, people are trying to uh, make kind of abstractions, and uh, there are people, kind of like techno, tech, uh, technical innovators, there are researchers, and then there are kind of like, a, um, like a scholars, they condense the knowledge to very easy to interpret. Right? So, for example, like Newton's first law, right? When we Getting invented is really hard to see. And now, like kind of an average junior, like junior school student, has, I think we are going to sort of kind of like the same circle of uh, uh, technology. People are building condensed abstractions, and uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that I think people are going to build toolings around these condensed abstractions so that uh, it will get easier and easier. I think I'm generally very optimistic on how this is going to play out in the next few years. Yeah, I would echo that and add that like to date, if you wanted to build a ZK application, you really kind of have to understand the technology itself. You have to be technical enough to like have some exposure to you know arithmetic circuits and elliptic curve photography, and you have to have an application developer brain. And uh, kind of like the activation energy to get to both of those states is just way too high right now. And so I agree, I'm, I'm very bullish on the amount of abstractions that are coming. We at Aztec are building a domain-specific language called Noir that will abstract away a lot of the core photography and then help developers rely on a, a standard library uh, of cryptographic primitives so that you don't actually have to be, be a cryptographer in order to build a simple application like Wordle or, um, or Hangman or you know some of the simple games that are being built. If you look at those GitHubs, um, it's clear that the folks building games even as simple as that have to have like deep understanding of zero-knowledge proofs. Um, so yeah, I, I feel very optimistic that we're going to get past that very soon. Want to add anything? Yeah, um, I, I sort of like came into the zero knowledge space from like the more theoretical side. Like I was, think you know, from like the complexity theoretic approach to it. And uh, like when I was first trying to learn some of this stuff, I you know, tried to read the papers like you would do in any other field, and they were like literally impossible to read. Like I couldn't understand a single word of what was happening in the paper. Um, and like I, you know, I I'd, like read you know academic papers before, like I, you know, in like ML and AI, and like they're they're generally like understandable like after a while. Um, but I think like one of the main sort of uh, sort of for the things that, that pe people sort of don't like about um, zero knowledge proofs is that it's very inaccessible because these papers are written in a way that um, in a way that's really hard to understand. I think there's like a trade off. Like one, you have to be really precise, you know, in photography and, and proof systems. But at the same time, you can get overloaded with notation, and it's very difficult to describe. But now I think like there's a lot more folks who are you know, going online, writing blog posts, like doing videos, like um, lecture series, things that you know like ways so that you can actually comprehend some of this material. And I think like once you sort of get a good footing into like how the different components of these proof systems work from a fundamental level, then you can sort of tackle like sort of difficult infrastructure level problems. Um, and then like, you know, I don't think that's necessarily like required to do if you're just building applications today. Like there are these like condensed abstractions that like Shima was saying um, that exist. Like you can build an application in CERCOM without knowing like how Route 16 works or Plot works. Um, but it's, you know, I think it's helpful when you like optimize some of these proof systems because we're, because we're still at that stage, you know, I think like we're probably in the stage of like 70s or 80s where you're still messing around with like, you know, some of these like, you know, disk drives, you're, you're messing around with like with the operating system and you're maybe, maybe you're writing your own operating system to use some, some, uh, some computers. So like, it's, you know, it's a, it's a difficult challenge, but I think like abstractions will be get, uh, get built over time. Yeah, super well said, guys. Um, okay, this, this question specifically for uh, for John here. So, you take a note of how experimental Z -tech, ZK tech can be by imposing limits on the uh, on the current Aztec protocol or the, uh, the current instantiation. So, um, what can go wrong with this uh, current iteration of, of ZK based tech? Um, you, you mean specifically the limitations that we place for security reasons on a protocol? Yeah. Um, yeah to, just to give people a background, we place a deposit limit on, on uh, kind of like inbound deposits to ZK money, which is our first party front end. Um, what can go wrong, especially in privacy systems, I think what's really challenging is if there's a, an exploit or, or a cryptographic failure, um, it's really hard to identify because of the inherently privacy-preserving nature of the technology. Um, that's kind of like a scary thing that like nobody in privacy tech really likes to talk about because if we're protecting your privacy correctly, then it's really hard to kind of like trace 
um, uh, exploits and, and deficiencies in code. Um, and it's something that we think a lot about as the complexity of these systems increases, and they're increasing by the day as we get to kind of more programmable private solutions. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of one of the unspoken risks of uh, ZK privacy specifically. Said. Um, and then for you, Rahul, uh, regarding your work with Jump here, so um, what can ZK do for bridges, and specifically, like, um, why don't bridges already use ZKPs if they're so generally powerful? Yeah, I think I think sort of the, the first question or the second question you asked, which is like why haven't ZKPs been been used for crashing messaging, is really because there's no need, right? Like, if you want to, let's say you build a crashing messaging protocol and you build some token bridge on top of it, and you're transferring, you know hundreds of millions of dollars. Do you want your fundamental technology to be based on something that came out, like a paper that came out two months ago, or do you want it to be based on you know, cryptography that's been well tested for 40 years? So I think like that's sort of the, the main like, trade-off here. Like I think we would all you know, generally like trustless cross-chain messaging so that we don't have to rely on external you know, third parties to authenticate messages between different chains, but um, fundamentally it's a trade-off of like, you know, like is this well tested and studied? Is there a chain you know, of trust that we can that we can follow back, right? Like in traditional cryptography, like there's you know, there's some implementation, and then there's like this chain of trust where something was changed, so then you can you can follow it back, you know, in time, and you can follow this chain of trust. But you know, with every new proof system that comes out and new every new implementation, like there's no real chain of trust. You're just trusting the person who implemented it, or you're trusting the person who you know came up with the protocol. Like you know, one 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 good example of this, not to you know, I love the love the Plonk folks, but like there was some, you know, a couple of bugs in like the you know, instantiation of like Fiat Shamir and Plonk in the paper itself, and uh, it didn't really cause any major like exploits, but like that could have been like a huge, you know, a huge problem for a lot of people, right? Like, um, and I think like some of these things like we have to be careful with. Like we're not, we're definitely not in the phase where like zero knowledge proofs are stable, um, but we should like still think about exploring them. And I think like to do like sort of trust, really good trustless cross chain messaging across you know twenty different chains probably requires um, proof systems that may, may literally came out like five months ago, like like the paper came out maybe five months ago. So uh, I, I think it's like reasonable to say we're still in a research phase. Yeah, I, mean, I kind of get the vibe, you know, how open AI, you know, they limit, you know, GPT-3 coming online, they're limiting the Dolly exposure. It's like, it just tells you how powerful this technology is. So it seems like there's an analog there with, with the way ZKP is rolling out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, awesome, okay. And then uh, for you, Shumo, uh, with the third account Manta, um, you know, uh, Rahul we'll mentioned that when you're at the paper phase, you're kind of in this very inaccessible type of ZK tech. And then uh, through some, you know, some process, it becomes production ready ZK tech. ZK tech and, you know, production is obviously a spectrum, and we're not at production ZK tech, what it will look like in five years. But can you just give us some insight to what does that process to go from the academic theoretical research to actually production ZK tech? Well, I think there are like a definite many aspect, right? So I think uh, from the idea of some paper, right? So usually from like symmetric constructions and you want to have these properties, right? But from the production, like you are acting in your product, right? And then you need to uh, ask these questions, what kind of product do you want? And actually, like what is the UX designs? How can you make less frictions, right? I think the product designs and uh, we kind of uh, learn the lesson um, like during the way, right? So for example, I can give you a concrete example, right? So basically we're a UTXO-based uh, uh, identity system, right? So, but at the same time, right, so and then we quickly realized, right, nobody wants to do like manual management of the UTXOs. Like, no one wants to like having uh, like separate coins, you have to manually manage which coin to spend, right? So then kind of we spend uh, quite some effort to build the account abstraction over the UTX on the wallet side. Basically, uh, we have uh, several people in the team that spend several months to build a good wallet for people to use so that you can handle the UTX on the for you, right? So that's the product side. The second thing is, uh, I think uh, I strongly anchor what John Wu uh, basically just said on the, the ZKP uh, like a circuit wallet, right? Circuit bugs are really nasty, right? So you don't want your ZKP circuit as box for different reasons. First, right, so when one ex exploit on the public blockchain happens, you may have some mitigation, but the circuit is kind of a black box. Uh, it will be the uh, kind of consequences and also the severity uh, most likely will be more um, more severe than kind of like a normal uh, software box. That's the first thing. And second, because inherently it's a black box, right? During you want to do a very good engineering from this from the circuit as well as um, to ensure the security, 
right? It's also much, much harder because uh, the, the toolings, for example, like debugging, um, like how to reason about the circuit, like formal verification, even with a circuit audit, right? So basically, every single spec in the developer's, de developer's spec, um, if you're working on ZK versus non-ZK, and working on ZK, I would say 2x or 3x. Right? So, yeah, that's what I did. Awesome. Super insightful. Okay, cool. Um, and this one should be quick here. So aside from each of your own projects or anybody else's projects on this stage, um, what is an example of your favorite instance of ZK Tech out in the wild? I'll give you a second to think about it then. Yours first, go for it. How in the wild means it's already deployed or some like, feature? I, mean, I, would, I would, yeah, I'd say like either deployed or like, you know, just an ob obvious idea that is, um, you know, in development. Yeah, I mean, I think like in general, maybe something that, that I've been super interested in like recently, but sort of maybe not yet deployed in, in mainnet, but like <laughs> things that have, you know, kind of been percolating are ideas like, you know, ZK VMs, like essentially like emulating the you know, entire VM in, in like in the ZK way. I mean, this is something that Shimos has been like heavily working on, but uh, that, I think that's super interesting. Like there's, you know, many good examples of this. There's like uh, folks working on ZK VMs, um, in particular to make it compatible, I think, one of the main issues um, with ZK is that you have to, like, you want to build it right in any language that you want, right? Like, you don't want to be able to, you know, redo all the developer tooling that exists for maybe, maybe for like EVM or Solidity. Um, let's say maybe you want to write stuff in C, you want to write stuff in Rust, you want to write, you want to write stuff in whatever you want, right? Um, maybe you want to write, um, maybe you could write in Java too. Like, if you can put some like model of Java and you could emulate it in a circuit, like that, you know, you could attest the computations, any sort of arbitrary computations in that VM. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's lots of examples of this um, that I think are coming out, and I'm like, very, very excited to see those. Yeah. Maybe it's a tough question, because you guys are kind of working on some of the most interesting <laughs> instantiation, so, cool. Um, yeah, so we'll move on to the next question, um, and I think I did have permission to go five minutes over, but if that's no longer allowed, okay, awesome. Um, so, from a, from a people standpoint, you guys work with a lot of other people in the space, um, how does the trajectory of, of research and implementation um, look, do you see it accelerating? Do you see more talent coming in the space? Um, kind of what's what's the outlook there? Is it is it is it uh, uh, something that is you know, coming out of universities more and more? Is there other industries that are interesting to be used? What does that trajectory look like? Uh, maybe you can first. I think uh, if you look at the like uh, the trajectory of the ZK technology, I will say um, it's mainly that both uh, the research community, academic community, and the industry community are like. Kind of joining and moving things forward. I think from the research side, and uh, uh, it's really great. So we have many great like cryptographers. Um, they conceptualize things. They are working on something like I will say uh, ten to twenty years horizon, right? So a lot of new stuff, new concepts are coming coming out for example, like quantum proof and uh, some like kind of like a new kind of uh, accumulators. And uh, on the industry side. There are many great cryptocurrency uh, projects. They are actually like really advanced in art. For example, I will give you two examples. Right? So one is that uh, when the um, one thing that improves the zero point proof efficiency a lot is basically, for example, when the, the Zcash um, Zcash project Z, uh, Z defined the trick like jump jump curve. Right? So that's kind of really boosts like ZK efficiency a lot. And also of course like uh, a plum coming from us. Right? I think uh, and also like a lot of uh, the currency project are doing um, amazing innovations in terms of engineering stuff. I think I do see a very healthy kind of uh, interaction between both the uh, academic and the, the uh, industry project of moving things forward. John, really want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I would just say that they're mutually accelerating where um, 
academics see the success of the private sector, and so there's the, I think the early stage pipeline, like grad students getting into cryptography are much more focused on CKs now. Um, the share in grad schools is just going up because there are economic incentives. And then at the same time, all, all the leading projects in the space are kind of like research oriented and academic in nature, and so they're closely collaborative uh, with academic colleagues. So yeah, I would just echo Shimon in saying that um, it's a joint effort. Yeah, I think actually like this space in particular like requires like the support of academia a lot. I think like this was like largely true. Uh, I mean, it's not necessarily true for like a lot of fields. Like you know, like one good example is like AI. Like AI was largely like a you know, grassroots movement that you know, like then turned academic in some sense after people were trying to explain the things that really cool engineers did, uh, like cool things that engineers did. Um, but you know, this is like something where. I, like it seems like there's like lots of papers that come out and then there's some implementation so it's like ideas are being explored in academia from a theoretical sense and then I think also like largely in academia like folks uh, don't shy away from implementation at all like in this space so they like they, they go after it and uh, I think that's super important but I think like there's a lot of, a lot more people coming into this space from an application standpoint too and uh, you know I think we're we're gonna we're gonna be ready for like TK summer maybe in a few months so like uh, I think I think we're gonna get to that point, so it's definitely a good time to get in. It's calling it now, CK summer. All right, so let's uh, let's review here for a second because I'm I'm feeling quite CK filled, and I hope some of us in the audience are. So um, it's an accelerating trend. Uh, uh, there, there, there's more more opportunities coming online. There's an ethos of, of freedom, liberty, uh, before the different values that, that the guests up here have. So kind of the final question is, um, if this is a really exciting technology. How can you get into either using ZK Tech at the application layer or contributing to ZK Technology Infrastructure layer? And feel free to answer either one of those or both. Uh, I'll throw it back over to both to start. Uh, yeah, I think like you know one of, one of the ways to get like like initially involved is probably just like start writing you know stuff in Zircom, um, like pick pick a language like that. Like, like easy. Like, like, write on media, um, blog posts. You know, like, no, actually, yeah, actually, <laughs> I think yeah. From from a like education standpoint, I think there's like actually a really good like set of lectures that have been coming out like recently uh, from like the ZK, ZK whiteboard sessions. Um, like I think the first few lectures were like building you know building a snark by like Dan Bonet and like some other folks from Polygon and you know, a bunch of different folks from like I think Aztec as well. Uh, like getting lectures on like how these little components fit together in proof systems and I think that's probably like like the best way. But um, it's all it's it's like an, it's an exploration. So I mean I'm still learning a bunch and um, you know it's, it's really exciting. John, what do you think about getting involved? Yeah, I'd say there are more resources than ever um, getting started writing applications in ZK, and um, a bunch of these abstractions coming out, um, all these domain-specific languages making it much, much easier to develop in the space, including from Aztec. So um, I, I think uh, I was watching some of Dan Bonet's lectures today, getting caught up in the um, ZK whiteboard sessions, and they're very accessible to nearly anyone. So I would say, yeah, just jump in. Wonderful. Well, that's going to wrap it, guys. Let's get a, a big round of applause here for Rahul uh, from John. John and I stand for short moments. Thank you, guys.